Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Master's Experience Series. Thank you for joining us over your lunch. We are waiting for more people to sign in. So in the meantime, please make yourselves comfortable with your lunch and a drink, and we shall start soon. Great, more people are signing in, so let's just dive right in. Welcome to the Master's Experience Series brought to you by Headhunt in partnership with School of Accountancy, SMU. My name's Tammy. Broadcasting live, we have with us Ivan, who will be opening the session with an overview on SMU. Thereafter, Professor Clarence Goh from School of Accountancy, SMU, will be sharing on the topic of data modeling in accounting decision-making. Before I hand over the time to our speakers, please note that there is a Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Please feel free to type in your questions at any time during the presentation. We'll also be conducting our feedback poll at the end of the session. So without further ado, I'll now pass the time to Ivan. Ivan, over to you, please. Thank you, Tammy. Allow me to share my screen. Can everyone see it? Great. Good afternoon and thank you for joining the Headhunt Masters Experience session today with the School of Accountancy at Singapore Management University. My name is Ivan and I'm the Head of Marketing and Outreach for Postgraduate Programs. And I'd like to start off with a very short introduction to SMU as well as talk a little bit more about the postgraduate offerings that we have. A premier university in Asia, uh, SMU is internationally recognized for its world-class research and distinguished teaching. And established in 2000, SMU's mission is to generate leading edge research with global impact and produce broad based creative and entrepreneurial leaders for the knowledge based, knowledge -based economy. Home to about 9,600 undergraduates and over 2,800 graduates, postgraduate students, SMU comprises six schools in the following, following disciplines business, accounting, economics computing and information systems, social sciences, as well as law. SMU offers about 11 bachelors and over 31 masters and PhD programs in the disciplinary areas associated with the six schools, as well as in interdisciplinary combinations of these areas. Our master's programs are globally recognized, employ an interactive pedagogy by a renowned faculty, as you will hear from um, Professor Go today, boast an innovative curriculum that is up to date and current and as well as real world. And at SMU, you get to tap into an unparalleled networking and career opportunities. And all of this happens at our centrally located city campus nestled within the arts and heritage precinct right next to the central business district. There are a few ways that uh, we can look at a postgraduate program. And most graduate programs, postgraduate programs are really categorized in two ways. One is a broad base in nature, providing you with the ability to work across many areas. But uh, there are also those that are deep dive in nature, where it's usually more specific in several disciplines, allowing you to gain expertise in specific functional areas. So the broad based programs offered by SMU are generally our management programs executive MBA, MBA, as well as a master's science in management. While the others that we offer in the suite of our postgraduate offerings um, are more deep dive into the specific disciplines such as accounting, finance, economics, law, and as such. So um, I'm just very quickly going to uh, give a summary of the different master's programs that we have. As you can see on the left hand side, these are a suite of finance programs in Master of Science of Applied Finance, Wealth Management, as well as Quantitative Finance. And then there are specialized masters in the management field, in communication management, human capital leadership, as well as innovation. Today, we'll be talking a little bit more about the Master of Professional Accounting and the Master of Science in Accounting. These are the two programs that we have in the accounting sector. Uh, we also have the Master of Information Technology in Business, which offers you an opportunity to specialize in different tracks in IT. And 
Of course, we do have the economics programs in both the Master of Science in Economics as well as as, as well as the Financial Economics program. And last but not least, our postgraduate degrees in law, a Juris Doctor as well as Masters in Law. Another way of looking at it again is whether these programs are pre-experience or post-experience. And the difference between the two is on the left-hand side, these programs accept candidates coming in with little or no experience uh, in the workforce. Whereas the ones on the right-hand side tend to be the most suited for candidates with considerable work experience uh, coming into the program. With that, I'd like to introduce um, our masterclass speaker for today, Professor Clar Clarence Goh. Professor Goh is a uh, assistant professor of accounting practice and director of professional development at School of Accountancy. His research interests are in the area of judgment and decision-making in financial disclosure, financial information comparability, and data and analytics in accounting. Following Professor Goh's talk, uh, we will be having Marie, who's the Manager of Recruitment and Admissions at School of Accountancy, to provide you more details about our Accounting Master's programs. And with that, please help me to welcome Professor Goh for the Masterclass on Data Modeling in Accounting Decision Making. Prof Goh, please. Um, thank you very much, Ivan. Um, let me just share my screen. Right. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you very much for taking the time to join us during your, your lunch break. Right. Um, my name is Clarence and I'll be going through a session today titled Data Modeling and Accounting Decision Making. So I hope that this session will be informative and give you a sense of how technology is playing a role in helping accountants to make um, better decisions in, in, in the workplace. Right. So this slide provides a very neat summary of what accountants do or what at least what we think we do, right? So all of us, we work for some organizations which engage in some sort of economic activity, right? Economic activity involved, uh, could be in the area of retail, manufacturing, service sector, whatever, right? Some sort of economic activity. And as these organizations engage in their economic activity, um, they engage in transactions, right? Sales transactions, hiring transactions, uh, and so on and so forth. And these transactions often are not straightforward, right? In terms of how we record these transactions. As accountants, we need to apply our accounting judgments to these transactions uh, to compile this information into useful information uh, that people can use, right? I think many of us would be familiar with some of this information, right? Uh, those of you who have looked at companies before, uh, information pro provided by companies before you might have looked at their balance sheets, uh, their, their, their income statements, and so on. Right? So these are info useful information which um, accountants compile for people to use that hopefully they would uh, make good decisions with. Right? So this, in a nutshell, summarizes the role that accountants uh, uh, play. Right? And the role that accountants play hasn't changed. Right? From the, from the, traditionally, this has been the role that accountants play. And today, this is the role that accountants continue to play uh, within an organization and within society. But what has changed um, is how accountants perform this role, right? And the key difference right now is that we have to contend uh, with technology, right? We have to contend with how technology is changing the way uh, that we accountants work, right? With technology, a lot of the things that we used to do previously have now changed, right? The way that we perform certain tasks um, have now changed. I'm sure many of us would have, you know, perhaps uh, read in the media, for instance, about how uh, machines or technology is playing a bigger and bigger role in the accounting sector to the extent that some accountants are worried that, you know, machines might take over our jobs, the robots might take over our jobs. Um, I think that was the fear in the initial years, but over time, um, I think most of us have realized that those fears were overstated, right? Instead, the emerging consensus these days is that you know, technology is something which is um, good for accountants, right? Technology is something which is going to be a, a, a boost for accountants, not just for the accounting industry as a whole, but for accountants uh, personally, because it will create many synergies which accountants can leverage on um, to perform their tasks um, better. Right? Um, 
And this is a survey which was perf recently uh, performed by Deloitte, right? Basically, uh, Deloitte, which is one of the big four audit firms in the industry, what they basically did is they asked, they went around to different uh, companies and asked, you know, within these companies, who in your company oversees analytics initiatives or who in your company oversees technology related initiatives. Um, and one very interesting finding from this survey is that out of all the C-suite executives, right, the CEO, the CFO, the COO, and so on, the CFO is the most likely to oversee these analytics initiatives, right? They are the most likely to oversee these initiatives. And the CFO, typically in a company, this person would represent the most senior accounting and finance person. So you may then ask, why is it that the most senior accountant in a company is the one who is most likely to oversee um, technology-related initiatives? Why not the CIO, right, who is typically more well-versed in technology? I think the answer is that, you know, as accountants, we occupy a very nice sweet spot, right? On the one hand, accountants are very in tune with the strategic initiatives of the business. That means we understand the business side um, of, of, of things, right? We understand the business side of, of things. On the other hand, accountants also have a very good grasp of data, right? Because when we, when we compile uh, the information to be used in, in creating balance sheets, income statements, cash flow, cash flow statements, and so on, we rely a lot on the data that is generated by a firm uh, to compile this information. So on the one hand, we understand the business. On the other hand, we, we understand the data. If we apply the technology or the analytical piece on top of this, uh, then you can really see how accountants are in a very nice position in terms of adding value uh, to a company from a technology or an analytics perspective. Right? In comparison, for instance, the COO, this person, he or she may be very well versed in the business aspect of the, the business, but this person may not be so well versed on the technology or data side. Uh, the CIO, same thing, right? This person may be very well versed in the technology side, but perhaps not so conversant on the business side of, of, um, of things, right? So overall, I would say that, you know, there's a recognition, right, that um, CFOs, we, we, can play a very, we, put, we can play a very important role in terms of how uh, companies right transform themselves to incorporate more and more technology and analytical procedures into their their workplace right but something that we need to have though in order for this to happen is the skill sets right at the moment uh, some feedback that we have from the industry is that many accountants they yes they are experts in accounting but they may not necessarily possess uh, the skill sets on the technology side so something which account, professional accountants need to think about is how they're going to augment their accounting expertise with the relevant technology uh, skill sets. And this is something that we have been thinking very deeply about um, at the School of Accountancy. And this is an article which I recently wrote together with um, two colleagues um, at, at the School of Accountancy. And in this article, we basically talked about you know, how accountants can equip themselves with the technology skill sets. In particular, we, we identify five strategies that accountants can uh, adopt in terms of you know, dealing with technology in the workplace. The first two strategies, as you can see on the slide, they are called the step up and the step aside strategy. Right? Step up and step aside. In these two strategies, the accountant basically you know, recognizes um, that there are certain tasks which technology and the computers can do better, faster, and more accurately than the human accountants, right? You can imagine tasks like data entry related tasks and more manual, real, manual, manual tasks, right? These kinds of tasks, uh, repetitive tasks, the computers definitely can do better than the accountants. And where we recognize that there are such tasks to be performed, we should adopt either the step aside or the step up strategy where we either step up to focus on higher level tasks which the computers cannot yet do, or we step aside, right? Same level tasks, but you know, we focus on the tasks which the computers cannot yet perform, right? Because by focusing on the tasks which computers cannot yet perform, then we as human accountants have an advantage over the computers, right? So no, no need to compete with the computers on the things which they are definitely better, faster, and more accurate than us on. 
right? So these are the first two strategies, um, step up and step aside. The third strategy is what we call the step in strategy. So in this strategy, we recognize that in accounting, there are a lot of tasks which computers can be helpful in, right? They can help us to perform this task, but computers by themselves cannot complete the task. They require a human accountant to step in to work alongside the technology in order to complete the task. And in accounting, there are a lot of such tasks, right? Which require um, subjective professional accounting judgment from the human accountant, right? The computers are not at the level to, to make this, this judgments yet. So the human accountant needs to step in, right? But in order to be, for a human accountant to be able to effectively execute the step in strategy, what the, this accountant would need to do is to acquire relevant skill sets, right? Because in order to work alongside the technology, you would obviously need to know how this technology works and to acquire um, the relevant skill sets, um, you know, that, that allow you to work with the technology. And this is where, you know, sessions like this, like, like, like we're doing today come in. Today, I'm talking about how data modeling uh, can be used in accounting decision-making. And, and data modeling is a very useful uh, technology related skill that accountants can use as they adopt the step, step in strategy. That means we can apply data modeling with technology and use the output from this technique to make better, faster, and, and more efficient decisions that can you know, uh, add value to our organizations. Right? So this is a step in strategy. And by and large, you know, many accountants, this is the, the, the strategy which would benefit them most. Right? Because as you can imagine, a lot of tasks uh, perhaps not just in accounting, but in other sectors and areas as well, uh, the human needs to step in to work alongside uh, the, the, the technology or the computers. So that's the third strategy. Um, the first strategy we call it step narrowly. So in this strategy, we encourage the accountant to search for niche areas for which the computers cannot play a role yet. Right, so this is a strategy which we outline, but in reality, it's perhaps not so easy to execute because as you can imagine, uh, in accounting as in like many other areas, there are hardly any areas which uh, technology, technology or the computers um, cannot yet play a role. Right? So we define this as a strategy, but in terms of how easy is it to identify an area which allows you to step narrowly, uh, it might not be so straightforward and easy. Um, finally, we, we, we define what we call the step forward strategy, which accountants can adopt. Um, in this strategy, accountants, what they do is they say, okay, technology is going to play a bigger and bigger role in the workplace. Why not I be the one to develop the next generation of technology to be used in the workplace to make um, how accountants work even more effect effective and, and efficient, uh, right? So the difference, that it, it sounds quite similar to the step in strategy, but in fact, they are quite different because in the step in strategy, what the accountant needs to do is to work alongside um, the technology. But in the step forward strategy, what the accountant needs to do is to develop the next generation of technology. And the key difference from the accountant's point of view is the amount and depth of, of technology skill sets that he or she requires. Right? In the step forward strategy, if you are going to develop new technologies, then you can imagine uh, the kinds of knowledge and skill sets that you need to execute this strategy is definitely going to be uh, much deeper and broader than what you require in the step in strategy, right? So we outline these five strategies as a way, as a means or a guide for accountants in terms of how they can think about uh, technology and how they can strategize and position themselves uh, to ride the wave of technology and to thrive in, in the workplace of the future where technology is going to play uh, a larger and larger role. Right, so this brings me to the next part of the presentation, which is the modeling approach to decision making. I mentioned earlier that uh, this is in line or congruent with applying the step in strategy, right? The data modeling approach allows accountants to work, step in to work with computers to make better decisions, right? To make better decisions. The computers themselves are helpful, but by themselves, they are not able to perform the task themselves. They are not able to make the final decisions themselves, right? We human accountants need to step in to apply our expertise uh, and judgment to make the final decisions, right? So the next question of course then is, what exactly is the modeling approach to decision-making, right? Sounds 
quite abstract. So what exactly is this? It turns out that it's not such an abstract concept after all, because everybody to some extent uh, uses models when we make um, decisions, right? There are different kinds of models. As you can see on the slide, there are mental models, visual models, physical models, and computer models, which is really what uh, we, we focus on, right? In terms of modeling approach in decision making. But just to illustrate the modeling approach, let me just use an example from a visual model. Right, let me just use an example from a visual model. So a map is an example of a visual model. Right, so let's say um, you wanted to get from point A to point B, but you're not familiar with the environment and don't know how to get from point A to point B. So you use a map, a visual model that can help you to solve your problem of how to get from point A to point B. So what would you see on the map? Firstly, you would see uh, key landmarks. Right? You would see the, the building names, you would see the road names, uh, and so on. Right? You see the key landmarks of the area on the map. And this represents reality. Right? The roads are actually there, the buildings actually there. Right? So this represents reality. So the first key point about models is that they represent some version of reality. Right? But is the full reality being uh, represented on the map? Not really, right? If you go back to the map, you will notice that along the roads, there are perhaps traffic lights, right, for instance. But the traffic light locations are not indicated on the map. There might also be, um, I don't know, street lamps along the way, right? But these street lamps are not being represented on the map. So in fact, a model would represent reality but it doesn't represent the full reality. It represents a simplified version of the reality, right? Certain aspects of the reality are not actually on the map. Then how does a model then decide on this simplification process, right? How do we decide what aspects of reality to include on the model and what not to include? Well, we need to think about what aspects of this reality are relevant to helping us solve our problem. Right? For instance, in getting from point A to point B, the road names are important because I need to know which road to walk along. The building names are likely to also be important because I need those to orientate myself as I make my way from point A to point B. So these are relevant pieces of reality that are useful for us in, in solving our problem. But what about the traffic light locations? Perhaps not as important, right? Because you don't really need to know where the traffic lights are located in order to get yourself from point A to point B. So the simplification process isn't random, right? A valid model accurately represents the relevant characteristics of the object or decision being studied, right? So we simplify reality in a way that provides us with the relevant aspects of reality uh, that allow us to solve the problem, right? So this is just something which we can all re relate to a visual model in the form of a map and how it encompasses certain characteristics which help us to solve problems, right? From an accounting decision-making perspective, we are also using this modeling approach, but instead of a visual model, what we typically use are computer models. That means uh, typically we have an accounting problem, right? There are some aspects of reality related to this problem. That means there are some parameters related to this problem. We would need to simplify these parameters by identifying what are relevant aspects of this problem and model these aspects onto the computers uh, using software and so on to help us to solve our problem, whatever problem uh, that it, it, it may be. All right, so this in a nutshell is the modeling approach, right? So hopefully with you know, something which you can all relate to in the form of a visual model or a map, we begin to see you know, certain characteristics related to uh, to the modeling approach, right? So then, this sounds interesting, but is, is the modeling approach something which is relevant in the workplace, you may ask, right? Do companies or organizations really use uh, the modeling approach in the workplace? So this was something which I was also quite worried about because this is something which I teach in my course. And if this is something which companies don't use, then I would be in trouble, right? So what I did is I said, I better go and do some research to make sure that what I'm teaching uh, it's actually used in the workplace. So I did some research um, and this is what I found. 
Um, this is a job ad posted by DBS Bank, and they're looking for someone to work uh, um, in IFRS 9, in, the, in this team that, that works on IFRS 9. Those, those of you who are familiar with accounting standards, you know that IFRS 9 refers to one particular accounting standard, and there have been some recent changes to IFRS 9. Under the old regime, under the old IFRS 9 regime, what we call the ECL regime, uh, the, the IRR regime, incurred loan loss, IIL, incurred loan loss regime, um, a bank which carries a lot of loans on its books would need to recognize any losses on these loans at the point where the losses are incurred, right? Hence the name incurred loan loss. When you incur the loss, then you recognize the losses. That was the old regime. Under the new regime, what we call the ECL regime, um, ECL stands for expected credit loss, right? Under the expected credit loss regime, we need to recognize the losses at the point where we expect the loans to suffer a loss. That means the loans haven't exactly, haven't, haven't actually suffered the loss yet. But if we expect that the loans are going to suffer a loss sometime in the future, we need to recognize the losses now. Hence the name expected, right? Hence the word expected in the name, expected credit losses. We need to, as long as we have an expectation that the, that the loans are going to suffer a loss, we need to recognize the losses now. So with this regime, obviously, it's a little bit more challenging for the banks because they need some way to form expectations of whether or not the, the loans are going to suffer a loss. Put in other words, they need to have some way to forecast what's going to happen to these loans. So how do they approach this? What you can see how they're going to approach this from this job ad, right? They're looking for a manager to support the development of advanced IFRS 9 modeling techniques, right? That means they want to approach this new regime, ECL, expected credit loss, by building models, data models, to help them to forecast what's going to happen to their loans. And if the forecast is that we expect a loss in the future, then DBS would then have to go ahead and book those losses uh, now. Right, so this is one example of you know modeling approach being used in an accounting setting uh, in a bank. Another example, this is a job ad posted by Cargill. So Cargill, they are in the business of commodities trading, and they are looking for a financial planning and analysis analyst. Right, so are, this person would be dealing with many aspects of accounting. One of the aspects which should uh, which they expect would take up about 25% of this person's time relates to business partnering. And he or she would need to, among other things, analyze customer prof profitability and to evaluate whether it's aligned to strategy by using simulation and business modeling. Right? So I suppose from this, from this description, what this person would need to do is to perform some analysis on uh, Cargill's customers or their counterparts and to form some expectations or forecasts about how profitable these customers are going to be for Cargill. And this analyst would need to use simulation and business modeling approaches to helping him or her perform this task. Right, so as you can see here, it's business modeling again is useful and explicitly required in this particular role. And interestingly enough, they even talk about using simulation as a business modeling approach. Uh, in fact, later on towards the end of today's session, I will talk a little bit and give an example um, of how simulation particularly uh, can be applied to help a company solve or make accounting decisions. Right, so this is yet another example. Um, this is something else. So the previous two roles were uh, the companies were hiring for relatively senior positions. This job ad on the other hand posted by Ernst and Young they are looking for someone at that very entry level, right? They are looking for an assurance intern to work in their forensic technology and discovery services uh, team. So forensic accounting, of course, relates to fraud detection, uh, fraud prevention, and that sort of thing. And it's becoming uh, a bigger and bigger uh, area of work for accountants because I'm sure many of us would have read in the media, seen in the news, many, many high profile fraud cases, for instance. So companies are, are becoming more and more aware of this risk and they're devoting more and more resources to this area. So this is a very rapidly growing um, area in accounting, right? So EY, Ernst & Young, they're looking for an intern in this area, 
right? And this person, among other things, would need to, you know, build models, right? Apply advanced modeling techniques in the development of frost, fraud risk models, right? So again, here you can see modeling techniques uh, in fraud, right? And it turns out, right, that fraud, detecting fraud is very, very, uh, using modeling techniques are very, very useful for helping companies to detect and prevent fraud, right? Because um, te these techniques are able to, you know, very specifically identify some traits that fraudsters typically uh, 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 demonstrate as they go about perpetuating their fraud. Okay. Right, so this is an example in, in from, from, from forensic technology. Right, so as you can see, right, just from a, a few examples, you can probably uh, get a sense of how you know, important or how widely used the modeling approach is um, in the accounting sector today, right? So accountants increasingly, right, we, we don't just need to be experts in accounting. Beyond our expertise in accounting, we also need to marry it with uh, a certain level of technology skill sets in order for us to, to perform the roles required by us, for us uh, by organizations, all right? And this relates back, of course, to the step-in strategy. Uh, which, I, which, I, which I outlined earlier, right? Without technology skill sets, you, you are not able to step in to work with the technology to perform all these tasks that we have just gone, gone through um, in these examples. All right, so let's talk a little bit more concrete, right? What are some modeling approaches, right? It turns out that there are many, many different modeling techniques that accountants can choose from many, many different modeling techniques. I've just put a, a, a few here, you know, just to illustrate for some reference, you know, what are some modeling techniques um, that accountants can and often do use, right? And just to illustrate, you know, um, as an example today, so that you get a better sense of how uh, accountants actually use modeling, I thought it would be interesting to, you know, look at an example uh, from simulation, right, simulation. Right, so what exactly is simulation. Simulation is particularly useful for accountants when they are trying to make decisions under conditions of uncertainty, right? And if you think about it, uncertainty is a very common condition in business in the business environment, right? Most of the decisions that we make in the business environment they are subject to uncertainty because we really don't know what's going to happen tomorrow or perhaps even. Uh, later today, right? We don't really know what's going to happen. So there are many situations in the business setting where accountants need to make decisions under conditions of uncertainty. And one particularly useful uh, data modeling technique that accountants can rely on is the simulation technique, right? And what sim the simulation approach really is to replicate a given scenario or event many times to generate multiple values of an output variable. Put in other words, we, we try to go through an event many, many times and to look at the different outputs generated by each uh, replication of this scenario and to analyze these outputs to try to obtain insights uh, that can help us to make decisions. So those of you who are familiar with the movie Groundhog Day, uh, this is quite similar. In Groundhog Day, the, the character in the movie, he wakes up in the same day over and over again, right? So he, 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 he goes through his day, he goes to sleep and then he wakes up, it's the same day again. He finds himself going through the same day over and over again. And this is similar, right? We have an event, let's say you have a, a sales event that is lasting one week, right? And, sim and, you want to, and you want to gain some insights into this event. What simulation would do would be to replicate this event many times. That means you simulate going through this one week event many, many times, and then you examine the outputs. Um, generated by, by the, the simulation model. So overall, what simulation would do is, is that it would allow a modeler, data modeler to discover characteristics of whatever output we are trying to look at from this, from this event. So what are some examples of how simulation is used uh, in the area of accounting and finance? Right, these are some examples. Um, this is something which I took from Vanguard. Those of you who are into investing, you, would be, you might be familiar with Vanguard. They, they have launched many ETFs and so on, right? So Vanguard, so, and they're into investments. And on their website, they actually uh, have a simulation model, right? A simulation model. 
And it turns out that simulation is very, very useful when you're looking at investment in the investment area, because investments are always, almost by, by definition, subjected to a lot of uncertainty, right? Because how is your investment going to grow over the next 30 years? To be honest, I don't know, right? Because the, it depends on so many uncertain inputs, inflation, uh, interest rates, and many, many other factors which are all uncertain, right? So what Vanguard did is they created a simulation model. And in this simulation model, they did a replication of a 30-year horizon, investment horizon many, many times. Put in other words, they simulated going through the 30-year event many, many times. So for instance, they perhaps did a rep replication of 100 times. That means they went through the event 100 times. And out of these 100 events, maybe they saw that 73 times the portfolio survived after 30 years. And the remaining 27 times the portfolio unfortunately did not survive. And with these insights, Vanguard is confident enough to conclude that you know, the probability that your portfolio survives 30 years is 73%, right? This 73%, it comes from the output or the replications obtained by the, the simulation model uh, that they've built here. Of course, depending on whatever parameters that you input in the first place. All right, but this is just an illustration of how the simulation can be used in the investment setting. Um, this is another application of simulation in the capital budgeting, uh, capital budgeting um, setting, right? So capital budgeting, I, I think many of us might be familiar with capital budgeting, right? In, in school, the first thing we typically learn about when we talk about capital budgeting is to compute the net present value, right? Net present value. What's the net present value of a particular capital project? If the net present value is positive, meaning there's a positive return to you, you would say, okay, let's take on this project. If the NPV is negative, that means it implies a negative return to you. You say, oh no, we don't want to take on this project. Let's, let's not consider this project. Right? That's typically how people would make decisions or how we are taught to make decisions um, for capital projects, right? whether or not to take on these capital projects. We look at the net present value. But how do we compute net present value. Those of you who are familiar with computation of net present value, you know that you need to apply a discount rate. Right? What rate do you want to discount the cash flows by? And in most entry-level courses, we assume that the discount rate is given to us. That means there's no uncertainty as to what this discount rate is. But in real life, this discount rate is subject to a lot of uncertainty, right? A lot of uncertainty. You don't know what, what the discount rate is likely to be. Right, so how? There's uncertainty. Turns out one very relevant approach would be the simulation approach. So in this particular example, what these guys did is they ran many replications, right? And you can see the, they, they have populated their rep, replications here, the results of their replications here. And you can immediately see that the decision is a little bit different from what we have learned previously. Previously, we have been taught, okay, if NPV is positive, we take on the project. If NPV is negative, we don't take on the project, right? That was then. Here, it's a little bit different. It doesn't tell us whether NPV is positive or negative. Instead, it tells us how likely NPV is going to be positive and how likely it is going to be negative because of all the uncertainty that we are faced with. And as the accountant, as the decision maker, what you need to do is to form some sort of judgment, right? And for taking this, what you see on the screen as an example, I would say roughly two thirds of the time NPV will be positive, roughly one third of the time NPV will be negative. So it doesn't tell you what to do, doesn't tell you whether to take on or not take on the project, um, but it provides some food for thought, right? You need to, to decide whether or not this is the level of risk, right? Roughly one third of the time you might suffer a loss from taking on this project. Is this work risk something which you or your company wants to take on, right? So simulation models, they do not tell you what to do, but it gives you the insights required to make a, a, an informed decision on, right? So this is another example of an application of, of simulation, this time in the capital budgeting uh, setting. Um, this next one is an example from uh, a, a recent article, I think published in Management Accounting Magazine. But this article talks about a hospital wanting to acquire medical equipment. Right, they wanted to acquire medical equipment. 
And from an accounting perspective, there were three ways that they could uh, go about doing this. They could buy the equipment, they could structure it as a capital lease, or they could structure it as an operating lease. And each of these three alternatives are subject to different levels of uncertainty. So again, with uncertainty, what we needed to do was to run simulations, right? And these are, these are the results of the simulation. And again, you can see, it doesn't tell you what to do. It doesn't tell you which is the best alternative. Rather, it gives you information to make an informed decision. If, for instance, your company prefers a higher average price and relatively low variability in terms of the actual price that actually occurs, then perhaps you might consider an operating lease. On the other hand, if you would prefer something with a lower average price, but you need to accept a larger potential variability in outcomes, then perhaps uh, the buy option would be preferable for you. Right? So this, these are the kinds of assessments that uh, the accountants would need to make uh, that could be used, that, that could be aided by, by simulation models. All right, so these are just some examples of how um, simulation models can be used in, in the workplace, right? But how do simulation models actually work? Right, I thought it would also be interesting, you know, uh, to provide an example, just a very quick example to show you how it could work, right? So this, this is just a very quick example, right? So imagine, right, you're an accountant for a company and this company is self-insured, right? So what does self-insured mean? So typically when you work for a company, the company would provide you with medical insurance, right? And that means when you see a doctor, you can take these medical expenses and get it reimbursed from the company. And typically most companies, they do not provide the insurance themselves, right? They engage an external insurance company, like say AIA, uh, Great Eastern or whoever to provide that, that, that insurance. But in this particular case, this company runs its own insurance program. So how does it work? So employees in this company, you know, they work for the company, they pay a certain amount to this company to, to participate in this insurance program. So once they're part of this insurance program, um, if they fall sick, they go and see a doctor, they can reimburse their medical expenses. So that means the company would then have to reimburse the employees. So where does the company get money to reimburse the employees? Two sources. Um, the first source is from the premiums paid, right? The employees pay premiums. I can use these premiums to reimburse them later if they see a doctor. If those premiums are insufficient, then the company would then have to dig into its own pocket, right? Contribute its own funds to reimburse the employees, right? So this is how this is this this is the 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 the, the, the self insurance program, right? So as a company an important decision every year is how much you should put aside to pay for you know, these reimbursements. Right? How much do you need to put aside? And it turns out that how much you need to put aside uh, may be subject to uncertainty. Right? Some of the inputs needed to calculate that may be subject to uncertainty. For instance, how many employees would I need to cover under this program? Right? It really depends on how fast your employees' numbers grow. Right? And it's a function of how many employees decide to resign, how many employees you can hire each given month, and so on and so forth. So you don't really know um, how many employees you're going to cover each month. That's the first source of uncertainty. The second source of uncertainty, of course, relates to the claims. Right? You don't really know how much employees are going to claim. It, it, it depends on how much the doctors charge them. It depends on you know, how often they fall sick. All of this is uncertain, right? So we need to find some way to deal with this uncertainty and we, we can think about how we can use a simulation model to help us to make a relevant uh, decision or, or, or judgment here, right? So there are in fact four steps to building a simulation model, right? And I'm gonna talk about how we can build a simulation model using a, a spreadsheet, an Excel spreadsheet. So most of us, when we think about simulation models, we tend to think, of them as being very, very sophisticated models that you need to use, invest a lot of money in to, to develop. But it turns out it doesn't necessarily be, have to be the case, right? We, it turns out that we are able to build simple simulation models on Excel, I think which all of us have, have access to. Right? So we'll build a simulation model in Excel, um, but what we need to do is think about how we model 
this uncertainty into our Excel, right? And the way that we are going to do it is to insert random number generators. So these RNGs, what they do is they model the uncertainty, right? They try to map the uncertainty into our model to, to, to reflect the actual uncertainty that we see in real life, right? That's step two. And in step three, what we need to do is to repeat the simulation. That means we need to perform the replication, right? We need to go through the event many, many times. And finally, in step four, we analyze the output and of course, go ahead to then uh, make whatever decision that we need to make. All right, so I have here just an example of such a spreadsheet for this problem, right? Let me just try to make it a little bit bigger so it's easier to see. Right, so this is my spreadsheet model, right? I need to figure out how much to put aside uh, to cover employee claims, right? So these are the 12 months in the year. Number of employees, like I said, we know roughly how fast it's going to grow or how many employees we're going to have in the company, but it's subject to uncertainty, right? So you can see I've put in a RNG here, right? I won't go into details as to how we model the RNG because I, it, 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 it you know, requires understanding of the RNG and so forth, which we don't have time for, right? So I'll, I'll just leave it as that, that we have an RNG here to, 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 to reflect the uncertainty in the employee numbers, right? The other source of employee of uncertainty, which I mentioned earlier, was uh, the claims which employees make. And as you can see, we have also put in an RNG here, right? Which again, reflects the uncertainty. And the thing about RNGs is, um, is that every time Excel recalculates, an RNG will generate a new number, equivalent to going through the event another time, right? So you can see here, if I go onto my spreadsheet formulas, I make the spreadsheet calculate, recalculate, you can see that my numbers jump, right? The numbers are jumping, they are changing because every time I recalculate, every time Excel recalculates, it's equivalent to going through the event another time. I recalculate again, it's going through the event another time. So that's the replication, but I need one way, I need some way to capture this replication, right? Because going through the event many, many times is fine, but it's useless if I do not capture the output of, of each replication. Right? So I need to find some way uh, to capture this output, right? So I capture this output here, right? Using this function called um, a data table. Let me just quickly demonstrate how a data table would work. Well, let's say I want to replicate 1,000 times. That means I want to go through the event, let's say 1,000 times, right? 1,000 times, what I would do is I would go, oops, I will go to data, open my data table, do this and click OK. Right, so what this does, essentially this step is I make Excel recalculate 1,000 times and each time it recalculates, I record the output here, right? That means the first replication, uh, what the company needs, needs to set aside is 33 million. Second replication, 38 million, 32 million, 40 million and so on, and, and so on and so forth. Then I do it 1,000 times. So how is this information useful to me? How does it help me to make a decision? Well, I can summarize this output, right? I can compute the average of this output, that means on average, what I need to put aside is 36 million. What is the minimum out of this 1,000 replications? It is about 27.9 million. Maximum is about 45.7 million. And if I wanted to, I could use this output to create a frequency distribution table, right? And this such a table would be very useful in terms of helping me to visualize what the outcome is likely to be, right? And again, like I said, this kinds of simulation output, it doesn't tell you what to do. That means it doesn't tell you how much you should put aside. Instead, it tells you, you know, how it gives you information about what the likely outcome is. And then as the data modeler, you need to decide what is a reasonable uh, uh, amount to set aside and what is the risk of you not being able to cover uh, the outgoings 
you know, given the, the results from the simulation model, right? Let's say I decide to, to set aside this amount, right? That's fine, but I'm, I need to be aware that I'm taking on some risk because I can see that there's quite a large probability that I may not be able to uh, cover the outgoings if I were to set aside that amount, right? So again, it doesn't tell you what to do, but it gives you the information that uh, you might want to, to use, right? In terms of, of making decisions, it gives you decisions that will aid you in making your, your, your judgments, right? So that is just a very uh, simple simulation model, just as an example to give you some uh, idea as to how uh, a data model in the form of a simulation model can help an accountant make better decisions. Right, so hopefully the, today's session has been, has been insightful to you, right? And hopefully it gives you a better sense of how accountants these days, we, we rely on technology to, to make decisions um, in terms of, you know, how we, we rely on models and so on and different techniques to make decisions. And hopefully it also uh, draws your attention to how, you know, modern accountants, we don't just need to be experts in accounting. We also increasingly, if we want to implement the step in the strategy to provide a boost to our careers, then you know, increasingly technology skill sets are going to have to play a, a bigger and bigger part in, in, in what we do. Right, so I hope this today's session has been um, insightful for you. Um, that's all I have for you. Um, if there are any questions for me, please feel free to put them into the Q&A and I'll be happy uh, to, to, to address them, all right? All right, there's a couple of questions. Let me just, let me read through them first before I, I respond, all right? Uh, Right, so the, I think the question really is about how simulation and uncertainty helps and the skill sets required, right? Would statistics be a better path to study modeling a, uh, uh, this approach, right? Would statistics be a better uh, path to, to gain the, the knowledge to, to answer these questions? I think this is the, the, the gist of the question being asked. Um, and it turns out, right, data modeling, it requires a lot of, uh, not just a single skill set. Right, in, in my classes, I always say that in order to be a good data modeler, you need three skill sets. Uh, you need accounting knowledge, you need technology skill sets, and you need statistical skills, right? And you need to put these three together in order to be able to perform data modeling, right? You need accounting skill sets because uh, this is the problem that you're solving, right? You're solving an accounting problem, so you need accounting skill sets. You need uh, statistical skills because a lot of times the models are based on statistics, as you have seen, right? And I think from the from the question, you still get a sense that a lot of statistics in, is involved. You really need to understand statistics in order to build a model. So a lot of the models are built on statistical concepts. So yes, you definitely need statistics. And you also need computers. You need computer knowledge because you're going to build your models, your statistical models in some, in some ways on the computers, because the computers are the tools that allow you to perform the analysis. So in order to be an efficient data model, you need to combine these three skill sets um, to make better decisions, right? So hopefully that answers your question. It's not a single skill set, rather most of the time when you talk about data modeling and accounting uh, and solving accounting problems, it's a variety of skill sets that you need to integrate uh, to make those decisions, okay? Um, I think there's another question about whether this is covered in class. Yes, I do cover this in class. So um, I do cover simulation in particular, both for a class in under our MSA program, as well as the MPA program, the Masters in Professional Accounting and the Masters of Science program. So I cover versions of this uh, in both of those two classes. The next question is Excel commonly used for organizations? Yes, it turns out that it's commonly used. Uh, many companies, in fact, the bread and butter of their data analytics or, or data modeling is Excel because Excel is a, uh, is a software which is free, which everyone has on their laptops or, or machines, right? So 
it's widely available to everybody and and you don't need to devote a lot of resources to building models on Excel. So a lot of times you'd be surprised, right? Even though it's, it seems like such a basic tool, many companies do build a lot of their analytics on Excel models. So I would say Excel, building the knowledge of building uh, models on Excel uh, is fairly important in, in today's workplace. All right. Um, besides Excel, what are the other application softwares that we will learn about? Um, I think there are many epic other applications, including um, SQL, um, Tableau uh, for data visualization, SQL for data management, and the various coding uh, languages like R and Python and so on. I think Marie later on should be able to give you a more comprehensive uh, answer as to you know what are the various various uh, software and, and techniques that will be taught within the MSA program, especially. All right. Okay, I, um, I think if there are no further questions or perhaps I could also invite Marie to give her, her presentation first, then we could continue with, uh, with some of the other questions that you may have at the end. All right, uh, Marie, maybe you can, you can take over. Okay, thank you so much, Prof. Clarence, for that insightful sharing. Um, I'll just need you to, to, to stop your, to stop sharing screen, and then I can take over. Okay. Okay. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes. Yes. Okay, great. Okay, so um, like um, Prof. Clarence mentioned, he actually teaches in uh, some of the courses that we have uh, in the two uh, master degrees that we offer here at SMU School of Accountancy. So we have the Master of Professional Accounting, the MPA program, as well as the Master of Science in Accounting, Data Anal Analytics, MSA program. Okay. So my name is Marie, and I'm actually part of the marketing and admissions team here at SMU Accounting Masters. I have with me today also my colleague, Faye, who, who is in the audience. So I'll just um, briefly run through um, the two programs, and then we can have a short Q&A after if you have any questions for us. Okay, so I'll share a bit more about um, the two postgraduate programs. But before that, uh, we're also very pleased to share that uh, uh, um, some of our SOA's recent achievements. So as you can see, SOA actually ranks um, first in the world in citation ranking, archival research, all topics and financial accounting, and first in Asia in all areas and all discipline research. So this actually demonstrates the caliber of our faculty and the high standards in research and education, which will be hugely beneficial for students who join our programs. Okay, so moving on to our two master programs. So we have the MPA on the left and the MSA on the right. So the two programs have rather different positioning with the MPA being more of a qualifying program and the MSA being more of an upskilling program. So for the MPA, it is a very good foundation program and we welcome people from any background who have a strong interest in joining the accounting industry. So you don't need to have any accounting background, meaning we also welcome fresh graduates from any domain. Okay, so um, it's also suitable for professionals who need to fulfill an expanded role or want to advance in their career, or professionals who want to make a career switch. The MPA is also Singapore's most recognized graduate qualification in accounting. So this means that you can enjoy an accelerated pathway to CA or CPA status, as you can receive certain exemptions with this so for the MSA, we are actually the first in Asia to launch an accounting program like this, which specializes in data and analytics. So this has actually given us the first mover advantage. As we all know, the accounting industry is evolving and there is a demand for people with the skills to handle not only accounting, but have the ability to handle big data as well. So hence, there is a need for a higher level and more strategic thinking professional who can provide business solutions based on the data given. So just to clarify that um, the program does not mean to nurture data scientists, but rather targeted at professionals who are already in the accounting and finance industry, but hoping to upgrade themselves with the technological skills and knowledge required. 
So the MSA also welcomes fresh graduates. However, you will require sufficient relevant background and also have a strong interest in data and analytics within the accounting domain. So the prerequisites for both the programs will be a good bachelor degree. Um, you will also be required to take an aptitude test. So you can choose um, between these three, the SMU admissions test, the GMAT or the GRE. So if you're certain that you want to join a postgraduate program in SMU, we will recommend you to select the SMU AT as you can take the test at any date and time of your convenience. So for candidates whose undergrad degree was not taught in English, you will then be also required to submit uh, an English test for either the IELTS or the TOEFL. Okay, so we are also renowned for our distinctive seminar style learning. So we don't just say this, it actually happens here at SOA. And you can see this from our smaller class sizes. So we do not have more than 60 students per class. So our discussions are actually kept interactive and it actually stimulates critical thinking in our students. So with this, right, you're actually an active participant in your own learning process and not just a passive recipient of knowledge, which is detected from textbooks. So our hallmark pedagogy actually develops graduates. And this is also very known in the industry. Um, graduates who are proactive, analytical, creative, articulate, and adaptable. So these are just a few of our partners and employers of our MPA and MSA graduates. You can also see that we have great diversity in the classroom, ranging from work experience to age to nationality. So students in our class will get to immerse and create strong networks, which will be very essential to your career. So these are the employment numbers for our MPA and MSA students and are based on uh, students who filed for graduation in January 2021. So yes, um, very optimistic numbers for us. And I'm sure you know that SMU is located in the heart of the city. So you'll have easy access to the central business district. We are surrounded by restaurants, bars, malls. So it's very easy to get to where we are, as we are also within a few minutes walk to some of the major MRT stations. So you will really have the opportunity to fully immerse yourself in the culture. You will also have access to a dedicated career coach who will provide one-on-one -on -one career coaching. There'll be a variety of enrichment workshops as well as skill-based workshops, which will be organized for you so that we can help prepare you to navigate the corporate world effectively. Okay, so I'll move on a little um, to the curriculum. So for the MPA, you will need to fulfill 14 course units. So you can see that there are five pillars within the curriculum. You will have the ability to actually gain some data and analytics knowledge under the business and data pillar. You will then have your professional accounting pillar, which focuses on all the core accounting modules. You will also have a range of electives to choose from. And as you can see, you will have the chance to choose electives from other postgraduate programs as well. So under the industry and professional pillar, this is where we develop you professionally out of the accounting core. Uh, these are also mandatory workshops um, and you will get to choose from a selection of workshops such as critical thinking, business sustainability, change management, and innovative thinking, just to name a few. So lastly, apart from our career services team arranging a series of industry pathway and recruitment talks, our program office also arranges a suite of out-of-classroom activities as we believe our students should excel holistically and not just academically. We also do include CSR components as we hope for our students to experience a meaningful and rewarding student life. So moving on to the MSA curriculum. So for the MSA, you need to fulfill 15 course units. Again, there are five pillars within the curriculum. So the first pillar indicates accounting booster. So it shows that we actually require you to have um, the essential accounting background before you join the program. You will then have the core modules which focus on data and analytics. And the last three pillars being the electives, industry and professional and program activities activities will be the same as described in the MPA program. So the only exception is that the MSA uh, curriculum includes a capstone course called the SMUX, which I will share more in the next slide. So expanding a bit on the SMUX, this is actually a value add for our MSA students as they are given the opportunity to work on real life issues given by our industry partners, meaning to say that our industry partners will bring real life uh, real-time uh, issues that they are facing and our students will then have to work on solving this business problem. 
So students are not only mentored by faculty, but they are also mentored by industry leaders. So it gives them the perfect opportunity to marry what they have learned during the course and apply it to this capstone project. So in all of the 20 over master programs that we offer in SMU, only five offer this and MSA is one of them. So here are just some examples of our SMUX projects that our students have done. Okay, now in terms of program structure, so the MPA and MSA programs are structured with four components. So you will be marked based on your participation in class, your progress assessments such as quizzes or mini tests. Uh, you will be assessed on group project as well as your final exams. So the actual weightage for each component will be dependent on the course and on the lecturer. Okay, so moving on to the admissions process, the first step would be um, for you to apply and provide the documents that we require. Uh, at the same time, you can also prepare for the aptitude test that you have chosen. So you do not need to submit your test results with the application. You can submit your application first and then provide us with the test results once you are ready. Then if you are shortlisted, we will move you on to the interview session with our admissions panel so that we can find out a bit more about you. And if the panel deems that you're suitable for the program, you will receive an offer letter from us within one to two weeks. Okay, so we do have some scholarships and financial aid. Most of our scholarships are awarded based on merit, so you will not need to apply for them. So what happens is that during the interview session with the panel, you'll be assessed holistically based on criteria such as your academic background, your work experience, um, the recommendations provided by your referees, and also how you perform during the interview. So as, as I mentioned earlier, SMU students are known for their ability to speak well. So this is your chance to show us your potential. Now, the only scholarship that requires a formal application will be the UOB um, SMU MSA scholarship. However, this only opens after the term begins, meaning to say that you will need to be an official student of the program in order to apply for it. So there are also other financial assistance, uh, such as the Skills Future Award Credits and the SGD Scholarship. So you can find out more about these via the respective website. Okay, so these are just some uh, testimonials from our MPA and MSA alumni. So as you can see, uh, the two testimonials on our left, uh, our MSA graduates who are already in the industry, um, they have recognized that there is a need for accounting and finance professionals to be equipped with data analytic skills. And from the two testimonials on the right, you can see that not all our MPA graduates are accounting trained. So we have seen a rise in candidates from different fields uh, who have the need to equip themselves with accounting knowledge in their respective roles. I mean, accounting, after all, is the language of business. Okay, so applications for the two programs are uh, for the August 2022 intake are open and they close in June this year. So we encourage you to apply early uh, to begin the admissions process. If you have any other questions uh, and would like to have an in-depth uh, discussion with us, you know, um, for us to you know, assess whether you're suitable for the program, uh, please feel free to email us at the respective email addresses as well, or you can just give us a call. You can also connect with us on our social media platforms uh, to stay tuned for our upcoming events and, and exciting updates. Okay, so we move, uh, we move now uh, on to our Q&A section. Let me just see. Okay, is it uh, recommended to take the MPA if I have already obtained uh, the CPA or the Chartered Account, Accountant SG? So this is from Wen Ying. So Wen Ying, I think um, it would be quite important for me to, to have a look at your, your, your work experience as well uh, before I can actually do a proper evaluation. Perhaps what we can do after this is that uh, we can have a, I can arrange a one-on-one -on -one call with you um, to kind of find out a little bit more about your background and see whether the MSA would perhaps be a more suitable program for you instead. How do we stand out um, as a S how do we stand out as SMU Masters in Accountancy as compared to NTU or NSU Masters in Accountancy program? So like I mentioned earlier, we actually are the first in Singapore to, to come up with this program. So we the reason why we came up with this program is because we actually do have um, very close ties with the industry. 
uh, we even have uh, our own uh, DAAB, so our Data Analytics Advisory Board. Um, so these are actually industry partners who, who, who work closely together with us, you know, to kind of like shape our curriculum uh, and to come up with, you know, um, to ensure that our courses are relevant to what the industry needs. And hence, uh, we do still have the first movers advantage as compared to the other universities. So there are no other questions. Okay. So um, if there are no other questions, uh, I will I will hand the mic back to to Tammy. Um, but again, you know, if um, if y'all have any other questions or want to arrange a, a consultation with us, please, please uh, contact us via the, the email addresses here on this on this slide, and we'll be very happy to arrange a one-on-one -on -one, uh, call with you. Yeah, so um, back to you, Tammy. Thank you, Marie and Prof. Clarence, for your time and for your sharing today. We hope you've enjoyed today's session and we'll now invite you to participate in our feedback poll. Please give us your honest feedback so that we can further improve on our master's experience series. The feedback poll should be popping up on your screen, so please take a few moments to share with us your observations. Just a couple of seconds more well, before we wrap up the session. Great. Thank you very much for your feedback and for joining us today. This session has been proudly brought to you by Headhunt in partnership with School of Accountancy, SMU. We welcome you to join us at our next session next Monday, 28th of February, on the topic of Managing Post-Pandemic Tourist Behaviour, presented by James Cook University. Please sign up early on our website, postgrad.sg. With that, we will wrap up today's session. We wish you a wonderful weekend ahead. See you next Tuesday. Bye.